Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I will be covering hemoglobin from the mass transport in animals topic from the A-level biology curriculum. So let's begin. So first looking at the structure of hemoglobin itself. So hemoglobin is a quaternary protein. So if we, if we remember the definition of a quaternary protein, it is where it has more than one polypeptide. So hemoglobin has four polypeptides, so that's why it's considered a quaternary protein. And hemoglobin contains four heme groups. So it has four heme groups which contain an iron ion each. So that's the Fe2 plus ion. So um, the four polypeptides that the hemoglobin has, all of them will e each contain a heme group and that heme group will have the iron ion in it. And the oxygen molecule can associate um, with that iron ion. And now because we'll have four iron ions, we have four heme groups, we have four polypeptides, um, so the hemoglobin is able to carry four oxygen molecules when it is fully saturated. So you need to know that when oxygen and hemoglo hemoglobin when they uh, join together, this is called oxyhemoglobin. And this is basically a reversible reaction because uh, when we end up forming that oxyhemoglobin, and the oxygen molecules can be uh, disloaded, they can be unloaded uh, or they can be dissociated and we can go back to our hemoglobin and our uh, original oxygen molecules. So now looking at the loading, transportation and unloading of oxygen. So you need to know that hemoglobin carries oxygen uh, as he oxyhemoglobins in red blood cells. Uh, and in lungs there is a high pa partial pressure of oxygen. So you need to be really aware of this curve. This is called the sigmoid curve. Uh, and this shows the partial pressure of oxygen on the x-axis against the percentage saturation of hemoglobin on the y-axis. So if we were to define partial pressure of oxygen, we could just say the pressure of oxygen in a given volume. So you can say how much um, oxygen there will be in that space. Uh, and that percentage saturation of hemoglobin is basically and the amount of um, oxygen and that's um, that's combined with hemoglobin, the percentage of oxygen that's combined with hemoglobin. Uh, and this graph has a sigmoid curve, so it's that S-shaped curve. So um, now going back to this, in lungs there is a high partial, pre uh, partial pressure of oxygen. So if we look at the highest point, uh, in our graph, um, we can see that the highest partial pressure is around here. So this is where our lungs are. So th this is where the high uh, partial pressure of oxygen is. And so in lungs, because the, uh, the, the partial pressure is really high, the hemoglobin has a higher affinity uh, for oxygen. So that's another keyword. So affinity, we just mean uh, the attraction of uh, hemoglobin towards oxygen. So at a high partial pressure, um, the hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So that means more oxygen uh, can be loaded and, or associated. So these are again two keywords that you need to be aware of. So more oxygen uh, can bind, can be, can, can be loaded uh, by the hemoglobin at this uh, high partial pressure, which is in the lungs. Okay, so at respiring tissues, so where the cells are respiring, there is a low partial pressure of oxygen. So in the lungs, we had a high partial pressure of oxygen because uh, the oxygen's coming from outside into the body through the alveoli. So there's a high partial pressure of oxygen. But at respiring tissues, there's a low partial pressure of oxygen. So if we look around here, this is um, where our respiring tissues would be. So they would have a low uh, partial pressure of oxygen uh, because there isn't much oxygen getting there. Uh, when when oxygen comes, it is used up um, and it's turned into carbon dioxide. That's why we have uh, a low amount of oxygen in that volume. So we have a low partial pressure of oxygen. So what happens is oxygen 
is more readily unloaded or it's more readily dissociated uh, from the hemoglobin. So again, learn these key words. So oxygen will, uh, will be loaded at the lungs and it will be dropped off in the respiring tissues uh, because there is a low partial pressure of oxygen um, at the uh, respiring tissues. You need to be aware of why this S or the sigmoid shape exists in the oxygen dissociation curve. So this uh, sigmoid uh, shape which I'm talking about. Um, so you need to know that hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen as the first molecule, first oxygen molecule binds. So if we're looking at the, let's say the first 25%, and the it's it's very hard for hemoglobin to be able to uh, load this oxygen this first oxygen and um, because of the shape of the hemoglobin itself so what happens is when the first oxygen molecule binds and uh, the tertiary structure of the whole hemoglobin molecule changes so when this oxygen has uh, loaded when the first oxygen has loaded there is a, a ch there's a change in the shape of the tertiary structure of the hemoglobin molecule um, and what happens is that cause that, that might uncover a binding site um, that was covered before and this can allow this can make it easier for the second and third oxygen molecule to bind uh, as this will mean that hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen so as you can see at first there is a very slow increase but then there is a sharp increase uh, um, around this point. This is because now we have uh, uncovered the binding site uh, of, uh, of hemoglobin, so it's made it easier for second and the third oxygen molecule uh, to bind to the hemoglobin. So th this means it has a higher affinity for oxygen. But then after the three molecules, after the three oxygen molecules have binded uh, to the hemoglobin, the shape of hemoglobin changes again and the shape of the tertiary structure changes again and now it makes it harder for the last, the final oxygen molecule to bind the fourth oxygen molecule. So as you can see at the final stage, you can see it is a very low increase uh, towards the end. So you need to know that organisms can be adapted to their en environment by having different hemoglobins. So, for example, the curve can be shifted to the left. Uh, for example, in this case, the adult sigmoid, the adult um, oxygen dissociation curve is on the right, uh, but the fetal hemoglobin, the fetal ex um, dissociation, oxygen dissociation curve has moved to the left. Now, why does this happen? Uh, so, when the curve shifts to the left, this means that hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So hemoglobin has a um, higher tendency to bind to oxygen uh, when the curve shifts to the left. Now, this means that oxygen can associate with hemoglobin uh, more readily, so more readily at lower uh, partial pressure of oxygen. So now if we're looking at the oxygen dissociation curve itself, so, for example, if we were to look at, let's say, the partial pressure of 20. So, what we can see in the adult hemoglobin, uh, the, uh, the oxygen saturation is only 40%, whereas uh, in the, uh, if we were to look in the fetal hemoglobin, it's around, uh, let's say, 65%. So, this means that more oxygen uh, has uh, been um, loaded uh, by the hemoglobin, so more oxygen um, is available for use. So this is advantageous to organisms with lower levels of oxygen. So now in this example, we're looking at um, fetus, so fetal hemoglobin. So the curve being shifted to the left is beneficial to the fetus uh, because the fetus is able to have get enough oxygen from the mother um, as the fetus does not have its own supply of oxygen, it has to get its oxygen from the mother. So in this case, um, the curve is shifted to the left, so that means the fetus will have high affinity for oxygen, so be able to get oxygen more readily uh, to get sufficient oxygen so that it's able to respire. 
Now the curve can also be shift, shifted to the right. So that may mean that hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen. So hemoglobin and uh, less readily binds uh, to oxygen. So how can this be useful? So we're looking at an example of a mouse. So this means that oxygen would dissociate from hemoglobin more readily uh, to respiring cells at higher partial pressure of oxygen. So for example, if we were to look at the partial pressure of 40, um, I can see that the mouse uh, saturation of oxygen is around 40%, whereas for human it's higher, it's above 60%. So how does this help the mouse? So it's advantageous to organisms with high rate of respiration, such as the mouse, which is moving around all the time. It needs that oxygen uh, to be able to respire. So when if the um, if there's lower affinity for oxygen, and that means that more oxygen will be dissociated, and uh, so more oxygen and uh, can be gained by the cells and the tissues. Uh, for aerobic respiration to be carried out. So now looking at the Bohr effect. So when the rate of respiration is higher, so for example during exercise, that means that more CO2 uh, would be released because there's there would be higher respiration, um, so leading to a uh, higher rate of oxygen in uptake and higher um, release of CO2. And when we have a high partial pressure of CO2, so because there's more uh, CO2 being released, there will be a greater pressure of the partial pressure of CO2. So what this does is it lowers the pH because um, the CO2 can be acidic if it's dissolved uh, in the solution. So it would lower the pH, make the conditions more acidic, and this would change the tertiary uh, structure of the hemoglobin. So and that that change in pH could affect, for example, the ionic bonds uh, in the the structure of the hemoglobin. Uh, and what this could do is this could reduce the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So the hemoglobin may have um, lower affinity for oxygen uh, because it's not able to bind as bind to the oxygen as before. It's not able to load uh, the oxygen as before. And this could shift the oxygen dissociation curve uh, to the right. So as you can see there, so with a um, with a higher pH, the curves on the left. With a, a lower pH, the curve has shifted uh, to the right. So this increases the uh, rate of oxygen loading at higher partial pressure of oxygen. So this is. Uh, similar to the fetal example. Now this is advantageous because it provides more oxygen uh, for muscle uh, and tissues for aerobic uh, respiration because the oxygen would be more readily uh, dissociated for example in the muscles and uh, the muscle cells and the tissues uh, for aerobic respiration and uh, so the muscle and uh, the, the cells won't run out of oxygen they will be able to carry out aerobic respiration as they would be provided uh, with a uh, with a greater uh, concentration of oxygen so how do different organisms have different hemoglobin so this is uh, related to the uh, proteins topic uh, but this question has come up in the exam questions previously, so I, I I thought I would go through this. So gene which codes for hemoglobin uh, polypeptides. So as you as you remember, the, there are four polypeptides in hemoglobin. So the gene which codes for these uh, can have different bases and different base sequence in different organisms. Uh, so as you can see there, so for example, this has a different base sequence um, for the for hemoglobin. And amino, so this would mean that the amino acid sequence of the hemoglobin polypeptide will be different because there's different genes, they will code for different amino acids. So that, that will mean that amino acid sequence of them uh, will be different as you can see in this example. And so that would mean that the bonds would form in different places between the R groups. So um, 
because the the um, the structure would be the amino acids sequence would be different. Uh, so the um, the bonds such as hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, disulfide bonds would form in different places such as in the tertiary structure uh, due to the R groups being in different places uh, as the first the amino acid sequence is different. So this just means that tertiary structure will be different for uh, the different organisms. Um, so, um, because it's hemoglobin as a quaternary structure, this would also mean that the quaternary structure of hemoglobin is different. So, overall, um, that that will mean that different organisms have different hemoglobins. And as we discussed, this could be beneficial to the organisms. Uh, for example, an um, an organism which needs Thank you so much for watching this video. If you did like this video, don't forget to subscribe to see more of these and you can watch my recent videos by clicking on the links popping up. Thank you.